by our pastor, Ray Curtis. Good afternoon. Is this loud enough? Okay, just want to make sure. It was too loud last week. <laughs> this will be part two of He Cannot Lie. Not going to go too much into a detail or review because we already know he won't lie to you. But last week we did learn that not only will he not, he cannot lie. He's proven it to us so many different ways, so many different times through miracles, through signs and for some reason his people still don't quite get it. For some reason we still fall for some of the things that Satan throws out for us. We're still so easily led to sin through Satan's devices. Now, I'm not one of those people that everything that goes wrong, oh, Satan did this. It's, it's you know, the old Flip Wilson stuff from the 60s. Oh, the devil made me do it. I don't I don't, I don't go there. Because there's a point where he becomes so in tune with you that he doesn't have to make you do it anymore. He just knows what to dangle. He knows, he's a, he's a consummate, I won't even call him a fisherman, let's call him a trawler, because he just throws a net out there and just grabs up everything. It's not nearly as targeted as we think it is. Satan's whole plan from the beginning is to offer mankind a false freedom from God. Freedom from God? I learned a long time ago to be careful whenever somebody talks too much about freedom. Sometimes you'll always hear some chains rattling in the background. Well, anyway, he offers this false freedom from God while building man's pride and once he's built our pride up you know what happens once pride comes to the full you fall which is really what he wants but he's willing to wait for it because he's got some things he wants first he wants you to get your confidence up he wants you to be full of pride but he wants you to praise him first and then while you're happy about everything that you've gotten from him he's in the process of doing what was the original plan anyway destroying mankind that problem began with the first humans he made the first humans begin to doubt God and trust in him Let's drop anchor and start at Genesis, the third chapter, the first verse. We've heard all of this before, but sometimes the refresher is good, and sometimes we can look at it from a little bit different angle and maybe see something that might help us out a little bit. Genesis, the third chapter, the first verse, where it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Yahweh had made. And he said to the woman, This was interesting. Why go to her? We'll get into that later. He said to the woman, Is it so that God has said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, he said, You should not eat it, neither shall you touch it 
lest you die. Whoa. Wait a minute. Now, all you armchair psychologists out there, what do you think about that? I looked at it and saw the kind of I said, wait a minute now. Let's try to get a little insight into Satan's strategy here. Man has for years through psychology attempted to psychoanalyze people by simply putting them in there, sitting them on the couch and talking to them and trusting that what they say is true in all cases. <laughs> Psychologists have learned through years that that's not a good way to do that. But Satan has a little bit different tact to this. Satan over time will observe and also watch what you do as well as what you say. Now, Satan was tipped off to Eve's state of mind by knowing what the original order was that God gave them both through Adam. Understand that, as has been said so many times. Satan knows the book probably better than we do. Now hold your finger here and let's go back to Genesis, the second chapter, the 16th verse, and you'll notice something very interesting. Genesis, the second chapter, the 16th verse, where it says, And Yahweh commanded the man, saying, You may free, freely eat of every tree in the garden. But you shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, while we go back to Genesis, the third chapter, the fourth verse, what did you notice there? Didn't say anything about touching it, did he? Yeah, that was a little bit of a mental twist there. Kind of let him know that she wasn't exactly on board with the order and had a little problem with it. Genesis, the third chapter, the fourth verse, and the, ser and the serpent said to the woman, knowing he had her right hook then, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God. Didn't say you'd be God. He said, as God. He's very careful with his words. He's not ready to pull you out of the water, yet he's still back and forth, playing with you. He's, this is a fisherman. This is a good one, if you will. I'm talking about in terms of skill. He's a bad one, but you understand what I'm saying. And you should be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasing to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, well, don't miss this, for years they've been saying, oh, that couldn't have happened if he, he couldn't have been there with her. Any question? Didn't think so. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now it's sure that Adam told Eve everything that Yahweh had told him to tell her. But with the prodding of Satan, doubt emerged in her mind. And probably a little bit more than doubt. Because at this point, she was questioning Yahweh's character as Satan kind of gently suggested that maybe he wasn't giving her everything because maybe he was jealous. And he was in the process holding back from them what was destined to be part of their destiny. I mean, it would come in good time, but he was promising it now. That, that's what that little hook was. Oh, you will become as God. Satan convinced them that the knowledge given by the tree would accomplish this. 
these longings, <laughs> you know, if you look at this and say, wait a minute, is this something you want? Yeah. Yeah. If we can get the same knowledge he's got, we can probably have equal power. If we have equal power, we don't have to answer to anyone anymore. Because we can control our destiny. And probably, maybe with the snake, take over everything. Just a fall. Not a good one, but it was what they were thinking. They were longing for this, and they were looking for it. But you warn sometimes to be careful what you want. You look in the mirror, and sometimes things look a bit different than they are in real life. You look at it, and sometimes, if, you know, if you look at the car and then look on the left side, it can be right up on you, and it looks like it because it's tinted a little bit, so it looks like it's a little bit further away than it is. It's just the way it works. But we're warned so many times to be careful what we want and don't become so lustful and so full of longing for everything that this world offers because it, off it offers some things that are not always good for you. And sometimes it offers things that may be good for you, but maybe it's not quite your time yet. First John, the second chapter, the 15th verse. First John, the second chapter, the 15th verse where it says, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. And that degree tends to be kind of balanced. The more you love the world, and that's, the, that's a love that's bordering on lust. Not saying that you can't go out and enjoy a ball game or enjoy something, but when you get to the point where you're willing to, we, we saw, I, I'll never forget it, it was back, oh, 85, was it, 86, when the Bears won everything? And there were people that, back then, the playoff games for the NFC were on Sabbath. And there were people that, oh, I, 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 I can't make it in, I, I'm, I'm, I don't feel so good. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to be able to come in today. And you call them back, and you'd hear hollering and screaming in the background because they were watching football on Sabbath. Not the worst thing in the world, but this is the beginning of that downstream toward loving the world a little bit too much. Verse 16, for all that is in the world. Let's go back. No, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world are three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and, th and three, this is the worst, the pride of life. This is not of the Father, but it is of the world, and the world passes away. And the lust thereof passes away as well. But he that does the will of God abides forever. It's fascinating how whenever God is dealing with you, he first tells you, this is what can happen. But if you do it my way, this is what can happen. And you can see very clearly the dichotomy there. You can clearly see what's happening. It says the world passes away. And it's lust. In other words, kind of Stay away from that lust. But he that does the will of God abides forever. You see, once Adam and Eve were given this knowledge of good and evil, the results weren't exactly as they expected. And certainly not what they wanted. The promise of Divine enlightenment as God just didn't happen. Didn't happen that way. 
Oh yeah, you know, it's just like the average person knows everything. Number one, nobody believes you. <laughs> Number two, somewhere down the line you find out, that's not, I didn't know that. So maybe you didn't know everything. But they saw the negative aspects of knowing everything right away. First thing they noticed was that you're naked. Hey, so are you. And I don't like the way that snake's looking at you. Ooh, that hadn't come before. Whoa. All of a sudden, there were whole different aspects to their being naked that they hadn't considered before. Before, there were other places in the Bible said that they were naked and were not ashamed. I won't even get with the kids here into what they were doing that they were not ashamed, but all of a sudden now there was shame even in that. And it got worse. They were suddenly ill at ease with Yahweh. Whoa, hey, I thought he was our friend. I thought he was, well, no, the snake said, but I don't know. Well, you trust him. I don't trust him anymore. All of a sudden now, we're looking around and that trust has gotten so bad to now when he calls for them, they were so ill at ease with him. When, they, when he called them, they were hiding. Why? What did they say? Oh, we're naked. You were naked before. <laughs> what changed? Your mindset. That's how you knew that they ate what they shouldn't have. Not only were they ill at ease with Yahweh, they were ill at ease with each other. Mistrust had come into the relationship. And you know what? The next train that comes into the station after mistrust, alienation. Alienation emerged. I'm thinking, maybe thinking too much, but I'm thinking this may have been why Adam allowed Eve to eat the fruit in the first place. He knew what the deal was. He knew what he'd been told was going to happen, and he says, well, eh, maybe we'll just let her take a bite and see what happens. And now all of a sudden, when, he take, when she takes the bite and doesn't die, now his trust is a little shaky. You see what I'm saying? Not fully understanding the timing of their warned deaths. Adam lost some faith when Eve didn't die. Sounds odd, but think about it. If you think about it, it'll make sense to you. Eve didn't die, so now he says, well, hey, she didn't die. Let me see what's to this thing. Takes his little bite. Sin has fallen now. They both have fallen now. There's no turning back now. There is a problem that must be dealt with now. This newly introduced mistrust of Yahweh and their subsequent division may have caused the enmity between Cain and Abel later on down the line. What do I mean when I say that? As Adam's relationship seemed to restore someone, that they still dealt with each other, there was still some, because of his leadership position, he still had to deal with him, so at some point, there had to be some mending of the fences there. And he taught this renewed trust to Abel. Cain, on the other hand, was influenced by Mama. And Mom's continued distrust grown now possibly to enmity. And this was passed on to Cain, who, in character, did the will of his 
spiritual father. Let's go to Genesis, the fourth chapter, the third verse. These little details sometimes are just as telling, and you don't really get as much information. That's why I get so, I used to get angry. Now I just kind of wonder, what are you thinking about that you can sit there and say, I don't read the Bible because I don't get it. It's boring. Oh, the Bible is boring, but you can sit up and watch all my children. Oh. Yeah. I didn't say that. Yeah, I did. Genesis, the fourth chapter, the third verse, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahweh. It doesn't really come right out and say, but, but the implication here is that there was an arrangement of sorts, a possibly a tithe of sorts already in Genesis. Verse 4, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Yahweh had respect unto Abel and to his offering because it was as he was told. Cain was probably told to bring your best stuff, and he said, I get that old brew stuff over here. Oh, it's for him. <laughs> you know how we get. Come on. And you know, you pass that stuff down to your kids, too. You know, something, I ain't going to say nothing about anybody here. I don't know how they know that, but you want, after daddy ain't around no more, you want to talk about daddy in a bit. Yeah, you know, your daddy, you know. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. And that's probably what happened here. You ain't got to give him, give him, just give him the brew stuff over there. He don't need the best stuff. But maybe the bird said to bring the best. Verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wrought. Oh, he got mad. And his countenance fell. And Yahweh said unto Cain, why are you wrong? Why is your countenance fallen? Hmm. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be his desire. In other words, he wants a piece of you. And you shall rule over him. How do you rule over him? Telling him to get out of here. I'm going to do what I was told to do. But it ended the way Satan wanted it to end. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The first test of Satan's little plan worked in Adam and Eve and in his longer range plan of putting doubt in man concerning the laws of God. It was also still working and had that added benefit of mankind being willing to kill to protect his freedom from God's plan. Of course, it was disguised as jealousy of others seeming closer to Yahweh, but we know he didn't care that much about Yahweh in the first place for other reasons. But it was the rebellion, not jealousy, at the root of Cain's anger. A coerced jealousy through Satan by way of Eve. Man has never wanted to obey anyone. Think about that little shiver that goes through you many times somebody comes up to you, go do this, with no, hi, so-and-so, whether you do this, it feels a little bit different. But when somebody just walks up and says, hey, Tony, go, bring me that water over there. What? You want me to do what? <laughs> Come on, it's there. It's there. 
It's in mankind. It's in all of us. We can sit here and pretend and say, I don't go there. I'm there. I'm walking in it. I got a problem with it. We all have a problem with it. But the problem is in here. Every one of us. Man has never wanted to obey anyone. The surest proof that God has of our love for him is what? Obedience. Obedience. Obedience to his way of life at whatever cost it comes to us through. However it comes to us. We look at this, we've read it, we've studied it, we understand it, and say, I don't care what happens. I know how this ends, and I want to be there when it ends. You make that decision, and you do this thing. At least most of us. At whatever cost it costs us. The sin of the world, however, is proof that Satan is still ruling the carnal minds of men. These will forever be the surest proofs of where people stand concerning God in the realms of faith. Secular people are most easily influenced, unfortunately, by the media. Satan doesn't have to fly around too much and talk in people's ears. He's got a six billion dollar media in every city to do it for him. Well, he just licks back and does whatever he does while he's being lazy. Secular people are most easily influenced, first of all, by the meat. Then, not biting on anybody, not even chewing on anybody, just all I've got to ask is this question. If you had a choice between believing something that somebody walked up to you and told you and walking up and somebody and you're paying maybe, what, 60000 a year tuition? Which one are you most likely to believe? I thought so. Thus, few even consider God at all in their day-to-day -day lives. And this is becoming more and more truthful every day. There was a reason Christ asked the question, when I return, will there be faith in the earth? Not because we're so horrible, we've always been horrible, but look at your newspaper every day. I'm not saying anything, John. When you throw a child in boiling grease, when you throw a kid out of a window, when you run over somebody, and you can just walk up to somebody and shoot them, these aren't good people. These are not good things. But most people, once you start talking about God, oh, you surely are joking. Surely you're joking. You gotta be kidding. You believe this stuff? That was 1977. Dating myself a bit, but that's when I was in college, 1977. And was going through the same thing then. Many people believe with an unassailable faith in evolution. Yet, evolution has been Satan's most successful tool of eugenics in the, in the allegedly modern age, in the alleged space age, where people say, oh, I believe in it, fine. I'm not here to say don't. I'm just saying that in this modern age, and I'll go on and explain this, but it is true. The greatest proofs of the existence of God are the intricacies of the human body and the ever-emerging complexities of the universe itself. It's fascinating how those who have expressed such faith in the Big Bang Theory don't even realize that the 
rapture theory of is, is the same and it's about the same age as the theory of evolution. Most people thought that, oh, I mean, I mean, oh, the Big Bang Theory, that's been around for years. Everyone knows this has been around for years. Everyone has believed this for years. Not anybody that was around before 1946. <laughs> that's when it came forth. George Gamow, a, Rus a Russian-born scientist who believed that a primeval fireball or an intense concentration of pure energy that they don't know where it came from at some infinite time in the past was the source of all the matter that now exists in the universe. Okay, if that's true, where did it come from? Did it reach in its pocket and grab it? It, every, you know, science will first say that you can't get nothing. What, you know, what did Billy Preston say? Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You can't get zero times zero is, and it doesn't change. That does not change. Yet, for all of its flying in the face of the laws of thermal, of thermodynamics, thermodynamics and its lack of explanation of how sometimes <laughs> at, at least one time in history something had to come from nothing. Okay, so if it happened once, who did it happen for? Certainly not Charles Darwin. Certainly not. For all of its flying faces, as I said, of the laws of thermodynamics and its lack of explanation of how something can come from absolutely nothing without a God, the scientific community and all who gain from their beliefs continue to force the theory of evolution down our throats as if it is law. <coughs> now let's get a little technical. Just a little. Well, it's me, so you know it's not going to be too technical. <laughs> Number one, what is a law? What is scientific law? Law is a, a scientific law is a statement based on repeated experimental observations that describe some aspects of the universe. A scientific law always applies under the same conditions and implies that there is a casual relationship involved in its elements. In other words, every time you do this, the same thing should obtain. After it happens 10 times, after you try it 10 times, you can say, this is the law of, okay, I'm going to pick up the piano and no, no, I'm just going to leave it there, but we're going to make it. No, no. After 15 times I do whatever I do to make that piano appear, now you can say that this is the law of the piano appears, if you want to call it that. That's now law. Anytime you do what I did, whatever I did, and make that piano appear, it'll happen. And that's a law. Now, Theory is a little bit different. Law differs from scientific theories in that they do not posit or claim as fact a mechanism or explanation of phenomena. They are merely distillations or the purest likely findings based on the testing of the results of repeated observation. As such, a law is limited in applicability to circumstances resembling those such as law. Because it's already observed, but may be false when extrapolated because the extrapolation may not happen the exact same way every time. Therefore, you can't say, oh, that's law. You can just say that's theory. You never, people, 
you know, people get too excited and you won't hear anyone get arrogant enough to call evolution law. The best they'll do is theory. Now, that in itself is not an insult. What it basically says is that at least the people that are doing this are intelligent enough to recognize that there's some big old holes in that problem that we haven't figured out yet, so we'll call it what we should call it. Most of the folks that you hear calling it law are folks that have no scientific background at all. And they constantly do this and get themselves in all kinds of trouble doing it, and other scientists will usually circle the wagons and shoot at them. It is true. Now, knowing this definition for law as opposed to theory, I wondered why such brilliant scientific minds would risk their reputations on a flawed theory, especially when its author, in the end, divulged his failure. I read this from Charles Darwin's My Life in Letters. It says, it's very short, and even I could understand it, it says, not one change of species into another is on record. We cannot prove that a single species has been changed. And this is from Charles Darwin. It goes further. In his Origin of the Species, da -da -da -da, I don't want to finish the name, it's rather racist. And then he was, had a chapter called Chapter Difficulties. He says, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection. Seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. And then the one that really got me. I had about a hundred of them. But I figured, I don't have time for that. So I found a guy that's a, a physicist and a mathematician. I figured that's heavy enough. I can deal with that. Wolfgang Smith, who says, a, sm a growing number of the respectable scientists are defecting from the evolution camp of evolutionist camp. Moreover, for the most part, these experts have abandoned Darwinism. Not on the basis of religious faith, as some have, or biblical persuasions, as others have, but on scientific grounds, and in some instances, especially mine, he says, regretfully. He wasn't regretting that he backed away from it. He was regretting, I believe, and this is just me, that there was nothing to replace it with that would be of sufficient strength to make people forget about the concept of God. So the question becomes, and rather hard to swallow, why is it so hard for mankind to accept the reality of a God. He's a lot plainer and a lot more honest about his own truth. He'll openly say, hey, I did this. I created that. I built this. Challenged, I think it was in Job 38, where he challenged him and said, hey, were you here when we hung the different places for this and we did this for that and when we set this up, were you there? Can you do it? That's some, but, they, but somebody told me a long time, if you, if you can do it, you're not bragging. You're just stating facts. <laughs> Romans, the first chapter, the 19th verse, where it says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. 
for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature or Godhead, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, in other words, you want to know something about it, look at what he made. And it'll tell you, I don't, I see, why do you think after what, some 6,000 years down here with physicians going back for all these years, why haven't all the, after all these years, suddenly we come to a point where they call the doctor, they don't say that they're great doctors of medicine. What do they say that they're doing? Practicing. And based on the amount of funeral homes that are still in business, I'd say that they're not doing a great job. I'm not saying that they do nothing, but the numbers just don't show them to have the same kind of reputation as the one who created the body. That's why when we lay hands on somebody and pray, we say that you designed this body, theoretically, I know you know how to fix it. Is what it is. We don't like to see once you admit that there is a God, now you have to say he has law. If he has a law, guess what? We have to keep it. Or else. It's all written down. And it's not something he snuck in in a codicil later on. It's not something that he snuck in at the end of a bill that they wanted rushed through Congress. It was something that you knew up front what you were getting into. And he didn't just say, oh, we're going to do this. He says, no, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a covenant. We're going to agree to this. You go through the whole thing and say, yes, this we will do. It's not like modern marriages. Oh, well, you know, with my first marriage, I'll do this. And my second marriage, I'll do What happened to the whole concept of till death do us part? What happened to that? In a lot of cases, it just kind of went the way of, I guess it evolved, I don't know. Let me show. But what is the most productive aspect to Satan in terms of the theory of evolution? Why does the world hang on to it when it's when everybody else is slipping off of it like a greased pole and they're not dancing because it is the only hook they can hang their hats on to claim that there was no non-human being who created the universe that keeps them unwilling unable and not having to obey anyone or pray to anyone and most horribly obey anyone. I honestly believe that some of these people would rather believe in a hostile alien coming in from outer space and would prostrate themselves before him hoping that he wouldn't ask them to actually obey and do anything. Evolution justifies might over right <laughs> through the fallacy of survival of the fittest. Even if the fittest are made so by superior weaponry and hatred. This is true. It's been true from Cain up to now. Even when that superior weaponry was nothing but maybe a rock. The world has not had one year since people started to multiply, since the murder of Abel when there wasn't some faction of people who were not at war with another. There has been not one year of peace. Other than a refusal to accept and obey a living God, man likes to have someone that he's better than, stronger than, better looking than, 
smarter than any of those things. And if none of that can be found, they're more than happy to grab arms and grab someone that they can give orders to and enslave. <coughs> and anybody that works a job nowadays knows that just because you get a check doesn't mean you're not a slave on some level. We've getting to, we're getting to a point where we need to understand that there is a God. He's revealed himself in so many ways that it's just hard to believe. But there is a larger, uglier reason why so many people want to hang on to not only evolution, but it's handmade racism. That'll be part three of He Cannot Lie.